You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, PJ team leader, jujitsu lover, meme enthusiast, and dad joke aficionado, Aaron Love. Back at it once again here in the team room, Colonel Bowen, or Colonel Byron Owen, sorry. Welcome for coming on, sir. What's going on? How are you today? I'll be whoever you want me to be here. <laughs> I figured as much. We were just talking. I've known, I mean, we've known each other through Shadow Sphere and through some other, you know, social media platforms for, I don't know, 10 years, you know, maybe, maybe more than that. And it's the first time that we've ever, you know, sat down and talked, especially when developing this one out. So, man, I'm, I'm super excited for, for having you on the podcast and I'm really appreciative of your time. And I'm also jealous of the fact that you're sitting in gorgeous Hawaii right now and it's beautiful out. I have to say Hawaii is not the worst place to uh, sit out a pandemic. Uh, so uh, things could certainly be worse. <laughs> Absolutely. So, sir, for our listeners, can you just give us a background and, you know, tell us about your your career and your history, you know, up until this point? I, I think I've had a fairly non-standard career, uh, which is kind of one of the, the beauties of the Marine Corps, and probably the military in general. Uh, I started off, uh, well, went to Naval Academy, so I'm representing uh, my, my Go Navy, uh, beat, you know, whoever, uh, <laughs> whoever service rivalry. Yeah, exactly. Whoever we're playing uh, this week. Uh, so joined the Marine Corps uh, out of there, uh, went into the infantry, uh, did two tours to Iraq uh, with 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, uh, became a reconnaissance Marine, you know, did that for a while. Um, actually let moved to Intel and then uh, found my way into cyber now. So that's, that's what I currently do. Uh, so kind of splitting in thirds, you know, infantry, you know, marine reconnaissance, and then now cyberspace warfare. Okay. All right. And then, so, so take us all the way back. Like, where did you grow up? Where, were you a, a Midwest guy? Like, were you an East Coast dude because of the Naval Academy? Like, did you always know that you wanted to, to go into the Marines or how did that, how did that choice even happen? So I was uh, born and raised in San Diego. Uh, my dad uh, was, oh, I was a, really, uh, I was really E5, close, E6 in the Army. Yeah, Midwest, San Diego. I mean, Midwest, uh, San Diego. Yeah, you're right in there. They're they're uh, essentially yeah, the same. God's country, uh, <laughs> breadbasket of the of the United States. I mean, yeah, California, it's, beautiful. All I heard growing up, you know, in the yeah, in, in the cornrows of uh, you know, uh, South Central uh, San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, I know. <laughs> Let me compose myself. Uh, all right, so I grew up in San Diego. So you're so, obviously uh, I was wondering during the military. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. So my dad was in the army. Yeah. He was a green beret. And so I always wanted to be in the military, kind of follow in his footsteps. Uh, my grandpa was in world war two, you know, landed on one of the, not the initial waves, but was it landed at Normandy and you know, went all the way into the battle of the bulge, uh, with one of the tank uh, battalions. Um, so I knew I wanted to do that. A long line of uh, proud uh, enlisted service members. And then when I went in, uh, to sign my uh, delayed entry paperwork to go to boot camp, uh, my mom was like, Nope, not doing that. Uh, right. I'm not signing your paperwork until you show me a rejection slip from the Naval Academy. Uh, you know, I was like, I'll, I'll show you a rejection slip from the Naval Academy, Yale, Harvard. I can get you rejection right. slips from anywhere. <laughs> I can get you rejection slips from anywhere. It's going to be mom. easy. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so I didn't get in. And so um, I'm ready to ship out. And then I got picked up for the prep school. And so the way it works in the, uh, in the Marine Corps anyway, um, is that if you get picked up for an officer program, that supersedes uh, enlistment. And so I was like, hey, no, thanks. Uh, I'd rather, you know, uh, go enlisted. And then the Marine Corps is like, well, there's a little lesson for you. You don't get an option in anything at this point because that's your signature on the paper. Uh, and then, you know, five years later, uh, I found myself commissioned uh, into the Marine Corps. Okay. That's, that's an awesome story. I don't, there's so few people that are like, no, I'd rather be enlisted. Like, forget the academy. I, I want to go be an E-man in the Marine Corps. But well, and then your mom, I, appreciate this. I, I mean, how much of a told you so from your mom did you get like, no, 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 you're going to go be an officer. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, you even tried not to. And the Marine Corps is like, not so fast. Your mom's right. Yeah. Well, and it's, it, I mean, it's interesting. You wonder how your, your world would have been. And I, you know, and I tell people is like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being an officer wrong with being enlisted. You kind of have to make your best choice for yourself as to what you want to do. I think as an enlisted Marine, I probably had a lot more fun. Not that I don't enjoy what I do now, but it's very different, right? You know, especially in the special operations community, uh, we're very NCO front, NCO centric organizations. So if you want to be the sniper, breacher, you know, free faller, I mean, you got to enlist. I mean, yeah, you have to do sure. that. Uh, I mean, as a as a Joe, 
as an officer, though, I think I learned, um, I think because of my dad, you know, my family all being enlisted, I, I kind of came into the world, uh, into my service, a little bit different perspective, uh, you know, what it means to serve and what it means to lead. And so I think that's kind of helped me out. And so I try to pay it forward uh, for all my, all my uh, you know, I, I, I always say Marines, I have airmen who work for me now, sailors, I have two guardians. And I'm having yeah. a hard time, you know, uh, yeah, again, oh, wow. you know, it's, it's kind of, doesn't really roll off the tongue to to official uh space force uh members i picture they just... kind of work every day on a hoverboard do you let them use the hoverboards inside yeah. that's the big question i <laughs> well, have for you well they were airmen up until today so today they took their oaths into into the space force and so we'll see what i'll, I'll, I'll let you know on monday uh if they use uh jet packs and Got they it. come in looking like the mandalorian uh into our workspaces um but uh no so i mean no, no regrets um i Definitely think I would have enjoyed it, but I mean, I think uh, as, as all of you here in the virtual room know, I mean, at some point you got to hang up the spurs and you transition from, you know, being that operator or being that, you know, one man uh, into more of a, you know, lead mentor coach role. Uh, it's just you know, time, time comes for us all. Yes. Yes, it does. And it, it can be painful at times, but um, coming out of the Academy, you know, I'm sure you guys get a lot of and gals get a lot of leadership classes and all this other stuff. And you coming from a, such a military centric family uh, background, did you have an idea of, of what type of leader you were going to be? Or did you watch like Pat and you're like, this is who I'm going to be come hard charging out of the Academy and start screaming in people's faces or kind of, how did that process work out for you? So that's a great question. I think one of the best things about the Naval Academy, and I'm sure it's the same thing at air force or at West point um, is that you, really see a lot of different leadership styles. I struggled at the academy. I had a hard time with the academics. I mean, it's really difficult, really challenging, very engineering centric. And so, you know, C student, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole and I'm getting to see a lot of people above me. And, and, and I'm like, I don't want to be like him. And I don't want to be like her, you know, because this person's egotism or this person's arrogance, you know, they're trying to punch this ticket to become, you know, the next brigade commander. And so I think that always stuck with me as I became an officer. I kind of had a uh, you know, book of recipes I didn't want to follow. And so I think that as I, as I went into it, I think I had a better experience as an, a second lieutenant because I, I knew what I didn't want to be and I kind of narrowed down what I should become uh, as an officer. Right, not coming in on top. You kind of had that experience. So when you first got into the fleet, did you, uh, did you find your mentor or how long did it take? And, um, or did, you know, who was that person that you looked up to in the Navy? Because you obviously had that, you know, that Green Beret background that you could look up to. But once you got in the fleet, how did that work out? So it's, uh, it's one of the things I always like to talk about with uh, definitely with the, uh, the young officers is, uh, is really my senior enlisted leadership. Because, you know, you have your company commander, but you also don't want to ask them a lot of dumb questions. And so uh, <laughs> I actually uh, had a, it was true. Or don't. Yeah. You never want to be I, the uh, guy that like, if the commander rolls his eyes at you, he's like, hey, any questions? And you can tell, visibly tell your commander's just like, this is not a good question. Is there, I don't know if there's any worse feeling, uh, but I can think of the hundreds of times I've done that in my head right now. And it just makes me cringe. When I ask a question, the commander's just like, no, you idiot. I'm just like, oh, that one's totally on me. And so uh, for me, uh, I had a little bit of a, an issue up front with some of my platoon sergeants, you know, so normally that's your, uh, your most important relationship and have a strong one come out the gate. I did eventually. Uh, but, uh, and I certainly didn't remove any of these platoon sergeants. And I was, that was a company gunnery sergeant, you know, first sergeant thing. Uh, but I didn't benefit from having that strong uh, mentor and partner up front. So I think my company gunnery sergeant was kind of that for me. Uh, I mean, real tough as nails, character, who I wouldn't say took any of us under his wing, because that's certainly not the, uh, his personality. But I think through his example, I mean, he definitely gave us a lot of lessons, some of them hard lessons. Uh, that kind of showed me, you know, how I needed to shape myself. And if, he, if I was off the mark, uh, he let me know. I mean, he was a very, uh, very much, I wouldn't say in your face, uh, but he was not silent about things he thought was going wrong with the company. Right. Like dry, straightforward, black and white. No, no, you know, the, not a lot of gray area. Once you get to that point in your career, it's like, hey, no, this is, or, you know, like this is the way, or maybe think about this or he doesn't sound like a very warm and fuzzy guy. I'm a warm and fuzzy guy, personally. With my <laughs> yeah, lieutenant. So I'm like, hey, right. warm and fuzzy you know, guy. Let's... That's the biggest lie that's ever been said on this entire show. Congratulations, you like, did it warm and fuzzy. I smile a lot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you smile while causing people physical pain. That's not the same, Trent. Well, like, yeah, so, but... for example, sorry. 
I think like one no, of the things good. that really stuck with me with uh, uh, Gunny uh, was Kevin. Yeah, no. I mean, personally, I've run into that a few times, and I think I've seen second lieutenants come out, and they have a little bit of that, I don't know, imposter syndrome or, or whatever it is, and they think they don't deserve whatever's happening to them. And, like, one of my pet peeves is when they're like, hey, man, you don't have to salute me. And I'm like, no, sir. No. this is, You are legally responsible for all of these things. I'm going to salute you. We're going to go through this process. Like, not – obviously, I'm not telling them what they're going to do, but just making them understand that there are, the roles are very specific, and that's this set up this way, and it works really well when everybody does their job. Um, so you're adding more stress to them, increase the training, you're trying to balance you know, all these things and these factors. And I know you learn a lot about yourself and how you are as a leader, maybe throttling too much, uh, not leading with compassion enough. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have good answers for that uh, because every situation is different. You know, every group is different, but that's real tough. Yeah, but I mean, I remember the first time I became an instructor, which is like, I think the closest I can get to, to having that kind of, uh, besides being a team sergeant, that experience and, and having that influence, that amount of influence over a group of, of men or people, you learn so much more about yourself than I think they learn through that process. You know, like your own tendencies to like, you know, blow certain things out of proportion or to not go hard enough. And then like that stress of, of trying to make sure that the mission is accomplished while also taking care of your people um, is one of the hardest. That uh, kind of intuitive feel that I'm doing things right. Um, I, I think that when you get back from there now, as you're looking back into, hey, I have to go back into the this environment. That's where you start the self doubt, and you know, and if I'm, am I doing enough? I think that when you're in it, it, it's just you know, it's like being inside the house and CQB, you just flow through it. But then when you're when you're, you're done, you're like now you're overanalyzing. Hey, what could I've done better? You know, what, what could I tighten up on? Uh, I, I think that applies. I mean, pretty much anything. I think um, no matter how much you're an expert in something, we always we're always questioning ourselves. I'm looking for self-improvement. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, that's the, the loop, right? You got to keep looking back at yourself and, and figuring out what you're good at and what you're not good at. Um, but, I mean, were there, were there any uh, things that you picked up that you, you still carry on today? Like, what are some of the, the deep-seated leadership principles that you found throughout this process? If you don't, you know, you're the, you're the leader, sir, so I'm, I'm trying to pick up these things from you. Like, tell me what you learned so I can learn from you right now. I'm not trying to lecture you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the big thing was you got to learn to trust your people, right? You got to let them go. And so you have to accept that you have only so much control in the world. And then when you're in the contact layer, I mean, you have none. And so the way you exercise control is by releasing it and just saying, hey, all these sergeants, I mean, if you're looking at me for the answers and you're under fire, I mean, then we've lost. I mean, we're just so far behind the power curve. And it's just, it's training your people to be, you know, a, uh, aggressive, uh, you know, initiative based, you know, decision makers are just going to go out there and just keep pushing and then not wait for directions from their staff NCOs or their officers, unless it's like, Hey, pull back. We're about to launch artillery or air. So you need to like slow down for a second uh, before you start releasing again. Um, I, I think it's hard for people because a lot of, you know, officers, you know, senior staff NCOs, they want to lead through that soda straw predator feed you know, you have exquisite communications. You think you have an intuitive sense of the battle, but you don't, you don't know anything. I mean, there's some E4, E5 trying to make sense of what's happening. And then you, you don't have a clue, you know, from uh, Angels 20 or, you know, whatever you're looking at in the battlefield. So, I mean, it's tough. So as, as you moved up in rank, were you able to keep that, that ground perspective as, um, you know, we, we all kind of to work ourselves to behind a desk, um, do you ever find yourself doing the, the same things that you used to complain about as a ground pounder? I only ask this because I do this all the time. I mess this up on a regular basis. No, I mean, so something that really stuck with me. And, and I think that, you know, as I, you know, as a company commander in combat, that you do this so many times. And I was a platoon commander for, I mean, six or seven years. I, I did it for a while, uh, all of which in combat. And so at, at the end of the day, right, I mean, the, the enemy is the enemy, terrain is terrain. And so when you see these things go down, whether it's over predator, or just hearing reports, you kind of get a feel of what's happening. You don't know exactly. And so I always told, uh, you know, like my like XO, the company staff, I was like, try to picture what's happening and start pushing assets like ISR. I was like, you know, here's a rat line, I think, based on terrain. So put some ISR there and then try to isolate the immediate area. So that young platoon commander, squad leader, whatever it is, 
can work his or her problem. So let's look at the next problem. You know, what's going to be the next thing on the horizon? You know, where, where's the high ground that he can't see or, you know, that she can't get to. And then let's look at that. And then um, I think that's how it probably was in like World War II in Vietnam, where we had this extended combat and these delayed tours where everyone's looking at this problem and really gaining a lot of expertise. I, I don't think we have that here by the way we rotate in. So, you know, you might have spent the last three years, you know, at the drill field or, you know, who knows where. And you didn't get that, you know, lion experience as a platoon commander now as a company commander, you know, battalion commander. You feel that need to like, you know, put the, the stranglehold on your people. Um, and it's kind of causes more friction than anything else. Well, and do you think that that leadership was like, do you think that philosophy was impressed upon you as a, as a really young lieutenant? Like give them bite-sized pieces, give them areas that they can do their job and like be free from, you know, the bigger picture. Cause it is overwhelming as I'm sure that, you know, being on, you know, being, you know, in combat and seeing the things that you've seen, like it's hard to have a complete picture and it's even harder, like if you're not exposed to it. So do you think that that, you know, that kind of like the focus on, let me give them a small piece of this pie and let them go do inside of their lane. Do you think that came from the Naval Academy or where did you start developing that? I think Aaron, what I'll tell you though, is you just got to control what you can control, right? So I don't, I don't even worry about it. I mean, it, whatever's going on in the contact layer, even if it's messing up, there's not much you can do, right? You can launch QRF, you can launch Medivac, you can launch ISR, but at the end of the day, you just got to trust your people, the right people, that if they suck, they'd have been fired, that they're just <laughs> right. going to work it out. I'm serious. I mean, like, yeah. so we, we don't fire people sometimes. And so sometimes someone's not good enough and then they got to go because we don't want to, you know, trust, you know, the, 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 the young daughters and sons of America to this leader. And then, you know, they got to go to the, you know, the wayside and someone else step up. But outside of that, just trust your people. They're going to figure yeah. I mean, so I, I do the same thing in cyber, right? I tell people, it's like, these are smart folks. They're going to figure it out. There's a reason I'm not on a keyboard. And I, I have more confidence than they do to be able to execute whatever we're telling them to do. So just let them do it. Because, you know, yeah. everyone like, what ifs themselves to death? You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Like, you're going to figure it out. You're going to sort it out just like you did every other time. And well, then, and that's that's where I kind of want to focus. I want to talk about, you know, you taking over that that first assignment. I want to, you know, you were moving from something that was, I, I bet you had to feel pretty, pretty good, pretty consistent. I bet you had to feel pretty on point with, you know, what you were doing and in that space. And then you were given that that first command. Tell us a little bit about that first command and what challenges you immediately saw when you took over. Are you talking in cyber or in the infantry? No, yeah, in infantry. Start with infantry, and then we'll talk about how it's different in cyber here in a second, too. So I, I had an advantage uh, when I went into infantry company command because I went as a platoon commander. Uh, that was a platoon, uh, force recon platoon commander. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like really just spent a lot of time, you know, kind of learning the combat skills, the leadership skills. Then I rolled into a recon company. And then when I rolled in the infantry company now after that, you know, I already kind of had a lot of things nailed out. I had a good command philosophy ironed out. I really understood like my role with the, the staff NCOs and my senior enlisted. And I was able just to institute something that I just at this point kind of become, I don't want to say second nature, but it was well rehearsed. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of issues, you know, with the company, with some of the leadership. Um, one of my big things that I'd like to pass to y'all as, as senior uh, NCOs um, is I always told my staff NCOs, like if your officers dorked up, I'm going to come to you. You're responsible, right? You got to get that, you know, get them training wheels back on the bike and get that young second or first lieutenant back into gear uh, so they can keep moving forward, right? And, you know, it's like, it's unfortunate, you know, but you have a, a huge burden on you that you have to mentor up as well as down. Nobody else does that. I don't mentor, you know, regimental commander. That's not going to happen, right? Uh, right? I only mentor down where sure. we expect, you know, everyone from E6 up to me mentoring their immediate superior, which is super tough, as well as down. As I think when people started to get right. that, and obviously I'm working through my senior enlisted to do that. I made, I made it very clear. It was like, if your, you know, second lieutenant is not prepared, I mean, I, I hold the staff NCO responsible, not directly. Uh, but sure. so then, you know, that, that helped a lot of things, uh, you know, clear up. <laughs> some, some of these, I mean, some of these staff NCOs are letting these dudes just tap dance. And it's just like, oh, come here, let, well, let's, let's fix this. And Trent and I feel that pain. Like it's hard being on that enlisted part of, the, of that relationship as well. Cause you know, it's, it's a weird thing. Like I worked for a mid grade 03, you know, like he was a, he was not even in the pipeline where I was a, a flight chief on the teams, you know, he was waiting to go into the pipeline. And now he, like, he is my first line supervisor. He's also my boss and he's my part of, you know, my, that command team that we have. So it's kind of tough. And he is, by the way, not dorked up at all. That's not a, a story that I'm telling about my boss right now, but um, it, it's hard being that en enlisted side of it. And even as a senior NCO to be like, okay, listen, I know you're a hard charger. I know you want to leave this one out, but 
just listen to me on this one and take this ad advice, take this recommendation, and maybe it'll help you inform your decision. How do you, how do you like to hear that input from a senior NCO? Do you like the guy to drive the train a little bit more and say, Hey, listen, I understand you have these big ideas. We'll talk about them later, but this stuff works now, or do you like it to be more collaborative? What do you like to see? So to be fair, I mean, I like to be involved, right? But at the same time, I, I know that. And so I pull myself back out. I try to use my senior enlisted as a conduit to mentor the other senior NCOs to kind of perform those functions. And you have like a, a, a back and forth, right? Where you're like, hey, you know, when I was in E6, this is what I did. Or, you know, hey, I see that, you know, uh, Lieutenant so-and-so is uh, getting in trouble with the boss a lot. Um, like, <laughs> right. I had one. So this is the Air Force, uh, Air Forceism here. This is very unique to your service. I had a captain come tell me, he's like, sir, I'm not going to be able to use my leave this year. I'm going to get in trouble. I need some help uh, with my leave plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up, right? I know you're not. I can already hear it. I already know the and story. So, <laughs> yeah, and I, I look at this Air Force guy, and I was like, I'm sorry. I don't really care if you take leave or not. That's up to you. And he's like, well, the Air Force really cares. I'm like, that sounds like a you problem at this point. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, I don't know what you want from me. Do you want to take leave? He's like, I'm trying to come up with a plan. I'm like, do you really want me to sit down and go over how do you use 70 days of leave between now and whenever? So I'll tell you what I'll do is like, just take 70 days of leave and just go to work. <laughs> he was like, he's like, that doesn't make much sense. I'm like, this doesn't make much sense. Like, why? Like, <laughs> none I, of this. Makes I got sense. like real things to worry about here, not your leave plan. And then I, I look at my senior and listen. He's, you know, he's like, yeah, I, he's like all over this one, sir. Right? Like, I'm like, like I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, there's some. So master sergeant be like, hey, sir, next time you have a genius idea. But you're on a go talking talk wager. You have to talk to me first. And then if I think it's okay, then we'll go talk to whoever you want. But until then, come on. Well, so my, my old platoon sergeant, uh, uh, Master Guns, Brian Blonder, uh, a real close friend of mine. Uh, we, we still uh, stay in touch. Uh, he used to tell me, he's like, you know, I'll, I'll give you advice. And then you go. And if you fall off the bike because you hit the, the roadblock I said you're going to hit, maybe come back to center and let's talk it out. And so I always right. thought it was a good technique, right? Here's some advice. Oh, did it, did it work out like you thought it would? Did the, did the Marine uh, 05 just be like, oh, God, we have to figure this out. Take leave from here to, you know, Sunday. It was just a real bizarre conversation. I guess it's a thing in the Air Force. So they, they, you know, you get in trouble for not using up all your leave. They were, you really do. Like you'll randomly have like commanders that never take leave. I had a commander at the schoolhouse um, that he, he took like zero leave and he just suddenly had like, 85 days of leave or something and they were like hey listen i know this is gonna be a bit awkward it's probably not a good time but you got to take that leave dude so he would just literally be on leave <laughs> that means, so that's I just great come to work in my civilian clothes or how does that's this exactly work? yeah i've made that yeah. joke for years that's what my leave looks like is come to work in civilian clothes yeah the marine corps doesn't care i mean like we want people to take leave <laughs> but if you don't want to take leave then that's your prerogative right you gave <laughs> sure it it's not like you probably didn't take it yeah 100 percent. anyway that's that was, like uh, Pain is the patient's problem. Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, if, if I had to try to sum it up from my perspective, I think the senior NCOs are the filter to the tactical level problems, right? Because uh, I let my, my officers come to me, you know, we, we plan together. And then when they have great ideas, I try to point out from my experience, because like Aaron pointed out, if, if I have an O3, I probably have a little more tactical experience than they do. And I just try to walk them down that road and be like, hey, I don't think this is going to work because X, Y, and Z. But really, it has to be collaborative, at least from my perspective, because sometimes these dudes have some some great ideas. These sirs have some some fantastic ideas, you know, and and just because I have experience doesn't mean that my experience <laughs> means everything. Uh, so so that collaboration, but that filter that they haven't yet developed it, is where I think I've, I've really made my money uh, with that relationship and move forward. If uh, you have any more. So, so let me lay something on you, officer. I think Give if me. we wanted to make the best, and I don't know what you guys have, platoon commanders, let's say. Uh, you know, your special tactics platoon commander. I mean, he'd be a PJ, right? It'd be a, a warrant officer, an LDO, totally. right? I mean, if you were to say your best, you know, uh, person to lead a PJ, I mean, that's, that's a Roman model. It's a Praetorian model where someone comes up the ranks and is a master of all things of that, you know, specialty, right? But what's the, what's the problem with that? You're never going to have a decent squadron commander. So, it, yeah, because they're always out training. No, right? I mean, so you have to develop these officers and you have to put them into the contact layer, which means into that platoon commander role. That's why we have this system. And so you got to look at it as an investment into building a better squadron commander, because otherwise someone's just going to show up, you know, with aviator wings. It's kind of how cyber was initially, right? No one came in at the O3 level into the community and then someone shows up and it's an aviator or, you know, a navigator. And they're like, okay, let's go. Here, command decisions being made. But I have no idea what it is that you do or, um, 
I, I kind of laugh because that's kind of me right now. <laughs> just showing up like, who's this recon dude? <laughs> Cybering. <laughs> like you, like you, you just described just exactly yourself. Described but, myself. Yeah, very uh, showed for it. All right, I guess that's a wrap. We're, uh, I guess we're done here. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, <laughs> so well, speak, speaking of that, like, what was that like? Um, you're, you're a former infantry, I guess. I don't want to say former because like, you Marines are very touchy about never you know not being well yeah don't say the f word hold on yeah. hold on hold on hey honey it's nice okay yeah we're, we're live okay, okay come on, that's a beautiful necklace though hey. just one of my marines uh no it's totally fine <laughs> trent has little airmen that run in the room all the time too it's uh, great yeah, every time you're like oh what's up i do sorry right. uh there's only one we're... rule and they can't be navy seals so moving from being a <laughs> this is a podcast infantry, not a book series <laughs> <laughs> moving from infantry and recon into cyber you i mean to me you're kind of going from like i don't want to say knuckle draggers but i'm gonna say it uh to recon you know high level problem solving guys but still very tactical into the cyber community like what was what's that first thing that hit you in the face when you made that transition to like super nerd uh side yeah. so uh I say we had some love, issues with my team. No, 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 it is. It is. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's a different world. Uh, so, you know, one of the first things, I like football analogies. I like sports. And uh, I came in and I said, hey, this is a couple of years ago, right? And so I said, we need to be more like the Patriots, you know, than the Browns, right? Because, you know, it's literally our job to spy on other people's playbooks, right? As long as we're putting rings and pennants on the wall and we're not breaking actual laws, then we're fine. Like, everybody's just looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? And I'm like the Browns, you know, they're, they're like, Oh, and 12 or whatever at that, at that point. Hey, listen, I'm right here. <laughs> I can hear you. Why are you doing this to me? Well, you know, damn well, come on, man. Well, at least you know who the Browns are. And I'm looking at one of my Marines. I'm like, Hey, Gunny, you're from <laughs> Cleveland. He's like, is that our basketball team? And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. <laughs> we literally didn't know. Did not... Three pointers. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. like, well, uh, sports ball. Let me get back to you on, on this one. So there's some, uh, some transitions. Um, no. So first day, right. Um, well, I guess the night prior, CG fires uh, one of the team leaders. I get a job. And I actually called my platoon sergeant. I'm like, hey, Brian, what the hell am I going to do? And he's just like, your job. And I was like, you're so helpful all the time with your advice and mentorship. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything this is about what you this. got for me. And he's like, just do what you always done. Just be an infantry officer. Go and walk the line, engage with your troops, and figure it out. And I was like, no, that's fair. And so I went over to where um, we have a – Obviously, we shroud a lot of that stuff in secrecy, but there's an area where they actually conduct operations. Uh, I call it the cyber trench. Nobody else calls it that. that, that I'm the only one. <laughs> You're that, the only one. And everybody's uh, like, the old man is so lame. You're like, this dumb nickname stupid. for this little, for building four. He calls it the cyber trench. What this a guy. Dumb. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm talking to this Marine, and it's, you know, he's kind of like, well, this guy's got some ring, so I just don't want to kick him out, but I don't know who the hell he is. And so I'm like talking to everybody. And at some point, he's like, I'm sorry, sir, who are you? And I'm like, I'm your team leader. He's like, I thought it was another guy. He's like, yeah, a lot's happened over the last 24 hours. <laughs> he got he's, fired. Long story. He got fired. Anyway, right? he's he got keep... no, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm the boss now. And so he keeps working. And then he looks at me. He's like, you're the first field grade officer I've seen here in four years. And I was like, oh, my God. Can are you, you kidding having, me? Yeah, can you imagine having an E4 on a platoon? Be like, yeah, it's the first time I've seen my lieutenant in like six months. Be like, Whoa, get out of here. And so he's like, I've seen him at formations. You know, I see them at these other engagements. He's like, no one's ever come and done what I've done here. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you know, <laughs> acting a near peer or something like that. I mean, it's something important, right? So, man, something important. I don't know. He well, I can't say exactly what it is. <laughs> right, sure. Something, but, I don't I mean, know, it was something, something important. It wasn't checking his email. I mean, so he's doing, you know, good work for the nation. And he's got no support. No one cares. He's got an 03 in the room. You know, he's a qualified cyber officer. He's getting no support. And I was like, what is it you need? He's like, if I just had A, B, and C, you know, we'd be rocking and rolling. I was like, well, let's get A, B, and C. He's like, well, I mean, been asking for four years. So I was like, I don't think I'm going to get it. And I was like, I mean, you're going to get it. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, let's, yeah, let's do it. And so we, we started answering these things, connecting dots. Uh, then I find out that, you know, none of the Marines have gotten awards for like, you know, years. Uh, staff NCOs and officers, I mean, of course, I mean, they, they're all, you know, sure. getting all the medals. Uh, but all the E4s, E5s are actually on keyboard doing stuff and not getting recognized. And so, that kind of, that kind of pained me. And so, uh, you know, then we went in and obviously fixed that, you know, got everybody. So not, not the medals are, you know, the end all be all, but I mean, you want people to get recognized for what they're doing. It's still recognition, right? That's still, it still helps. You know, it doesn't like get me out of bed in the morning, like getting a, a, a 
after action report of some work that I did, like those sort of things don't keep you coming back to work, but like having those little things, like having a recognition for your hard work saying, Hey, you actually affected this. You actually did. Here's the thing that you did that makes you irreplaceable to this unit. That's a big deal. That makes people reenlist. That gets people back to a healthy organization that, that helps with a ton of stuff. So it's not necessarily the recognition, um, but it's, it's being, I, I guess, validated in your work. Like that's a big deal. Well, I'll say too, if you're getting no medals and you see officers and staff and is getting tons of medals, that's where you start pulling on that DD-214 blanket, uh, you know, and you get out of the machine. Uh, yeah. so it's an absolute poison, absolute poison. Uh, right. I mean, and these folks are walking up making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on Wall Street protecting a bank. Yeah. Not like at the well, gate. That'd be the infantry guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I do want to talk work. about that. That's, like that's your people's you, job. Yeah. <laughs> Where you are now and what you're doing now, can you tell us at all about it? Like, what, what is the primary mission set of what you're doing? You already mentioned you have a, it's essentially a joint, a truly joint force to include the Space Force. So what is it that you're getting after at this new command? And, and more importantly, why did they pick a knuckle dragger like you to lead it? Uh, that's going to get tough. Um, <laughs> so, so cyberspace warfare is warfare. And so this is what I tell my people is that warfare, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we're dealing with computers now, but you're dealing with people. Like first and foremost, it's people. It's our best people against their worst people. Trying to find, you know, the, the seams and gaps in their systems, which I'm telling you is probably not a computer. It's probably, it's, it's a person. It's a person who's not changing their password or, you know, who's uh, not upgrading their, their, their system software. And then that's going to be the touch point you need to exploit. And I'm like, so find, I, I call it the find a dummy doctrine. You know, find the dummies in these systems and then exploit those seams and then get to where we need to be you know, so we can support our, you know, uh, regional objectives or national objectives. Uh, like I always tell people, it's like, you know, you know, Aaron, you're probably pretty guarded, got good OPSEC, uh, but you got a kid, you got a babysitter, you know, the babysitter sending you PDFs, hey, this is the bill for the month or the gardener. Uh, they might not have good OPSEC. And so it's trying to utilize maneuver warfare. Uh, so to, you know, not attack directly into a surface, don't go after that bank vault door, you know, go after the hinges, you know, for the breaches in the crowd, you might understand something like that. And so uh, I think that leadership is, is uh, tantamount in all domains. Leadership's leadership. Um, you, you have to approach people differently, maybe. Um, motivate them differently, but engaging people, I mean, that's the basic leadership principle. And then I think warfare is warfare, right? I mean, so sure, cyber is a little bit different than you know aviation or anything else like that. But I mean, so attacking someone on the flank is attacking somebody on the flank. I mean, you might have to conceptualize it differently, uh, but that's what I think I was able to bring to the fight uh, here. Um, a lot of people try to lead through their computer screens. And I've seen that not just in cyber. I've seen that in other areas of the DOD, and that is the wrong approach. You got to lead with your feet. Not like directly, but you got to you know, move around and talk to people. <laughs> I got it. And actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to circle all the way back, you know, to, to that leadership piece. You know, like you've now served at every level, even levels that you didn't even think. You know, I, I'm sure there's, unless you're super duper smart, when you're, you know, a Navy midshipman, I'm sure you weren't thinking forward to be like, oh, I'm going to be one of the first Marine commanders of a, of a cyber unit and there's going to be a space force and they're going to work for me. I'm sure, you know, I, I guess I'll ask, did you foresee all that? I thought I was going to get out. I thought I was going to go force recon, <laughs> do be a platoon commander, then get out, you know, and because um, to me, that's what would, would be fun. I mean, I wanted to be enlisted. Yeah. I was like, I wanted to do this job, be in the contact layer, you know, get the qualifications, get the badges. You know, that's what you think about as a midshipman. Uh, but, oh, so one thing I do want to talk about is, I mean, so you quickly learn, I mean, that this is not about yourself, right? And so this is something I like to talk about with the young special operations officers is that your journey to becoming a, a combat rescue officer, you know, special tactics officer, uh, or is it a, a CCT officer? It's about yourself, right? It's about your individual journey, your discipline, your physical fitness, your grit that gets you across that, uh, you know, that threshold and you get your beret or your pin or whatever it is. But at that point, it stops being about you at all. It cannot be about you like any bit. It has to be about the NCOs that you're leading. And I think some people have a hard transition with that because, you know, make it through the academy, make it through these, you know, these tough uh, selection schools is an individual effort, but leadership is a team effort that you have to take yourself out of. So the, the sacrifice that you make should be, you know, the largest sacrifice because you got to be the best example, um, you know, and that may, may be putting more hours in and whatever it might take uh, to be the best you can uh, for your people. Um, Yeah, that's that's got to be tough. I know on the on the NCO side, that transition, like kind of like that E five six seven transition from the doer into the manager into the leader, 
is really tough for a lot of people. And so I can't imagine coming in right off the street and they're like, hey, you're the boss, ready, set, go. It's not about you anymore. You know, like your entire life up to that point is all about you. And we, we have kids, right? It's all about them. And it's all about you up until that point. So I think that's, that's, that's gotta be pretty tough. So, so how do you, how do you view like the second lieutenants now? And, and what do you tell them about making that transition besides it's not just all about you? Like what are the tools that they can use to, to make that transition effectively uh, so that they don't hit as many potholes along the road? So it, the nice thing about being a, like a battalion commander is, I mean, it's not very hard for me. And so, you know, if you have someone who's like a spotlight ranger, you're gonna find out very quickly that I do not appreciate that. <laughs> that I'm absolutely not going to reward somebody, right? Yeah. But like, so yeah. look at what I did. And I was like, you know, you're, you're just going to, you're going to hit a brick wall. And I made it very clear to all my subordinates. And so I got, like I said, I got officers from every service. Uh, I'm actually the only Marine. Um, but I tell them, I was like, so, so who did this? Like, sir, I did. I was like, did you do it? Or was it Petty Officer Smith? Right. Cause I think that they did it. And so I tell them, I was like, I want to know who did this. I'm going to walk over and talk to that sailor or that airman or that guardian and, you know, hear about, you know, hey, what did you accomplish? To walk me through it right now it's something uh you know something i learned a long time ago is that we got 120s in afghanistan if you're familiar with like the 120 millimeter mortar yeah sure so we didn't have them before we had 81s and so you know go down okay. to the mortar pit and i was like hey walk me through this devil like how do you use this show me how do you know how do you shift fires this thing if you had to displace it i mean this thing's heavy right and so you get a concept of what they're doing and so i try to do that with cyber too i was like you know so all of us is like you know the queries the different um systems that we use to manipulate data and i'm like show me how you run a query i was like man that makes no sense to me does that make sense to you and they're like oh yes sir you got to look through this you know and so to me it's the same thing right i'm like what is it i'm asking you to do help me understand what it is and let me just you know appreciate it and they're like oh sir no one's ever you know run a query before and i was like oh well, no, it's important because i thought this was more intuitive but it's not it's actually a ton of work that you have to do and i appreciate it and it's so incredible that you found this you know whatever opportunity it is and then you know you get them a little like commendation or something or even like i've given out a 24-hour passes to people who find good opportunities because uh, I'm just trying out different ways to encourage them and to continue to be good you know, at their jobs and help them be recognized. And then I also think it shows the young platoon commanders and like, this is the way to do it, right? Like the, like the Mandalorian, like this is the way. Right, right, yeah. Right. Well, because a lot of you these facilitate folks, success. Yeah, well, I mean, so I tell them, I was like, so I as a commander will get credit for everything my unit does. I also get fired if anything goes wrong. I was like, you don't need <laughs> to highlight yourself, right? Because you're always going to get the credit. That's just how being an officer works, I think. So don't take any credit, push all the credit down and then let these young, you know, NCOs get a little bit of recognition for the things that they do. You'll get yours in the back end. You'll get your fit up. Don't worry about that stuff at all. Just worry about your people. You worry about your people. Sorry, sorry FedEx truck. <laughs> always on time. Always uh, on time. They may not come no, to you know, call, but they're always on time. DMX says that. <laughs> someone for someone. Uh, <clears throat> You know, so if you take care of your people and you care about them and you do everything you can to support them, they'll do well. You're going to get your mission accomplished and then you're going to get everything that you need on the back end, your promotion, whatever the case might be. Or you won't. And that's fine, too. As long as you're, you have satisfaction in what it is that you do, you should be proud of that. Right. I want, I want to ask a question that just kind of popped into my head and it's not on my, my piece of paper that Aaron wrote down for me. But I've always wanted to know what you have to have fun. I, I have to have fun at everything that I do. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You know, like I try to find the joy in everything. What, what is the fun part about being a commander? Because honestly, I, I see a lot of commanders around and I don't see- Doesn't seem like a lot of fun. Very many of them having I'm a lot of fun. I'm gonna be honest with you, sir. Right. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it's a lot more fun being a, a flight chief, being a platoon sergeant. I gotta be honest with you. That's a, that's a pretty good amount of fun. Commander's never having fun. So I'll be really honest, I, I'm having better. a blast. I love going to work every day. I really enjoy what I do. Um, if you'd have told me that I'd be commanding a cyber unit as a second lieutenant or as a midshipman, I told you you're crazy, you right? Um, but it's, it's about people, right? I enjoy working with people. So when I showed up my present unit, you know, morale was really low. Um, and then everybody's like, no, ah, how, how many hours are you putting in? How many searches are you doing? How many queries? And people really run down. And so I think seeing the transformation of the unit, which is really about setting conditions for people to be successful, seeing the morale go up, you know, just engaging with people, you know, you just talk about football. You know, you could tell, you know, uh, some of the uh, senior NCOs would be like, sir, you know, they've never spoken to a field grid officer. They just don't come down here and talk to these guys and, and gals. And so that, that's the part of the job I really enjoy. And, and then obviously, you know, you start seeing mission success. Uh, you start seeing uh, young people make connections. That's where innovation happens. That's where success happens. It's at the E4, E5 levels. And you get oh, to be yeah. a part of that, right? And they're all energetic. 
not all old and you know busted <laughs> like we <laughs> cynical. are cynical <laughs> cynical yeah. just mad at the world in general right like so whether it's uh, being a pj or, or being a cyber you know nco when they come to you with that opportunity they're like so look what i did look what i found this is this critical thing you know whether it's you know doing a really good charge or you know being a, a good hearst master um, or finding a cyber opportunity or i go or if i found malware that no one's found before uh, it's infectious it's like it energizes me and motivates me to keep going they, in this job they, yeah. they found a virus it's infectious uh you did it congratulations <laughs> you did it you tied it well, all in <clears throat> i mean it's a it's a real so we, yeah. This is a cyber podcast, but finding new malware is a big deal because you're finding new vulnerabilities and systems that we use. And yeah. so you think about what that one person, you know, if they were a civilian, I mean, they could get you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for finding a vulnerability in like Windows or you know Internet Explorer. And then we get um, uh, I don't know, Challenge Coin. I don't know what they would be. <laughs> you get coined by the commander <laughs> at a ceremony you didn't even want to go to. That's what those dudes get. They're like, you have to show up for this. It's late on a Friday. And you're going to stand up in front of the entire squadron. And you're going to get a coin for finding this malware. Meanwhile, civilians are getting a Benz out of it. Yeah, 100%. But, <laughs> yeah, well, Benz requires maintenance. It but, does require. Yeah, sir, the success is always, you know, mission success. There's two sides to it. There's always the leadership and then there's the followership. And you're, you seem very invested in your people, obviously, and, and, and mission success. But what are the traits uh, that you look for uh, in followers and the followership uh, characteristics that you look for or that you uh, you value the most? A hard question to answer. Uh, so I think that one of the things that's difficult for some people in the special operations community is that a lot of people, so whether whatever ethnic background you come from or, or, or gender, um, we're all kind of the same in the special operations community, right? Everyone's, very, you know, we have a, like a type and pattern of, of, that we develop and we build, you know, everyone's very aggressive physically fit and a lot of the personalities are fairly similar or more similar than dissimilar uh, that's not going to be the case in cyber in the infantry or in some of these more you know mixed units and i, I mean mixed by sense of, of different mos's like a staff are we gonna have a lot of different personalities so i think that as a commander we have to adapt ourselves to our followers and i mean so it's, it's just really do you have character do you, do you care uh you know do you work hard and if you don't work hard right i mean this isn't the nfl and that's the advantage you have in some of these soft communities that you can cut people and then the rest oh, yeah. of the military, you don't have that ability. You have to maximize every single person and develop them and invest in them to be the best that they can be. And some people are going to make it to 10 and some people are going to make it to four. And we need the fours just as much as we need the tens, right? The ones we can drop, right? You're like, well, you know, you, you did some Coke. I'm sure it was fun. <laughs> what comes That's... next is not going to be as uh, entertaining for you. Uh, you, entertain then, you, know, the, you, uh, you entertain the devil's lettuce this weekend. Therefore, we're going to see, yeah, we here, gotta... however. I had a Marine, uh, not to tell too many stories here. I had, I had a Marine who uh, got busted for, uh, he got a grand theft auto, destruction of government property, and DUI. And so I get his buddy in here, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? What did you do? Down in Waikiki, and he's like, I took his keys. And I'm like, so, wait, what? And he's like, that's why I got the grand theft auto. That's why he stole someone's car. And then he uh, hit a uh, park wasn't ranger his vehicle. Well, no, he's like, I was like, why'd you steal a car? He's like, well, I didn't want to get a DUI. And I'm like, do you know how DUIs work? He's like, you can't get one if you're in someone else's car. I was just like, <laughs> did you ever just like think to, did you ever just think to Uber? How, it can't be that big of an island. No. Did you just walk home? Don't you guys do that? Like, <laughs> so like the, uh, the air cushion went off and so they found him passed out with the horn blowing, you know, uh, in this stolen vehicle. And so I had to break it to him. I was like, yeah. So you did get a DUI, you know, it's not how DUIs work at all. I'm like, who are you talking to? You know, like, well, you know, of course, Lance Corporal next door, you know, giving him <laughs> legal advice. And so, you know, he's gone. Yeah, he's no longer. <laughs> anyway, this is absolutely the best story that I could have hoped. In service. For. But, it, but it does actually bring up a good thing. Like, how are you, you're no spring chicken, you know, Trent and I, we're at the same thing. So how is it like, what is the culture shock like when you have to lead these people that are 20, 25 years younger than you and are on a completely different wavelength. How has that transition been for you? I don't think it's as difficult as you might think. I mean, so as an 05, I'm, I'm not down there in the trenches with these 18, 19, 20 year olds, right? And so you're no longer at the point where you have direct leadership with everybody. Like you would as a squad leader or platoon commander where you know every single thing about every person in your formation. I, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people under my command right now. Now there's, I, I do know everyone's name, maybe not first name. I know everybody's name. I try to know who, where they're from. And, and the, that could be a struggle sometimes because you know, people check in and then I, you know, I was like, they didn't bring them over to the office for me to see. Uh, but that's, 
it doesn't get too much deeper with that. Now, there might be some people I know a lot more because they work closer to my office, but especially I got some uh, offsite locations, in different cities. I mean, I, I don't know everybody in my off, off station uh, aside from their names and, and recognize them on the VTC, which is, I'm telling you, is a real challenge with the mask thing. Um, oh yeah. Yep. To be able to pick people up. But um, so you have like, you know, gradients, right? Like who do I interact with the most? I mean, it's my uh, senior mass sergeant. He's closer to my age, you know, my deputies closer to my age, my opso is a major, same thing. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, when you talk to some of these junior enlisted, I mean, we're not talking about, I don't, I'm not listening, I don't know what music they like or, you know, it's <laughs> trending on well, it's, Twitter. Well, it's a little it, Dirk and a little Pump, so. I, you know, that's not, that's not what comes up, I mean, because there's such a, a divide between the two of us, just, I mean, just having the conversation is, is mostly about work, um, and I think that they just appreciate the engagement, right, just someone, you know, Lieutenant Colonel wants to sit here and talk to me about 10 minutes about what I, what I got going on. Uh, but we're not like best friends or anything. I mean, that's not, the, that's not the way that it's supposed to work. So, um, sure. I think my thing is that what we need to do as senior officers or field grade officers, senior uh, NCOs is just kind of set conditions for them to be successful. Right. Which is, um, establish like work environments that are inclusive, you know, people respect each other, you know, promote character, kind of these things. Uh, that, that's the kind of stuff that I, I focus on uh, when I when I go around and circulate with the troops and make sure everyone's being treated well. Um, and I don't even know what kind of you know rap song is is you know uh, popular uh, right now. And so, <laughs> well, but do you think that your prior so you had a lot of experience where you you stepped outside your comfort zone the second that you started taking over you know you know for the the recon gig you're okay check got it like the leadership gig okay I went to the naval academy check got it I know how to be a good baseline officer. I imagine you stepped into this, this whole new world really as part of this cyber thing. Do you, do you think that you kind of, you find it easier to connect with those younger airmen, guardians, Marines, seamen? Do you think it's easier for you to kind of connect with them because you, you've already had a career of like, okay, you, you don't know what combat is, but that's okay. You're just doing a different type of combat because you've talked, you know, leadership is leadership and having these specialized uh, capabilities, they really are all the same. And leadership really is all the same. It's you caring about your people and you you doing your best for them. Do you think that that stance, that your leadership philosophy, actually helped you to take over like a completely dissimilar, you know, sort of sort of realm that you're in now with the cyber gig? Well, I think at this level as lieutenant colonel, I'm not expected to be an expert at anything, and so I think that helps. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's true, right? Well, as an officer, you may not expect to be an expert of much, uh, but you have a strong staff. So everybody in my staff is cyber. So like right off the bat, um, I think that helps me out. And a lot of people on my peer level are the same way because very few lieutenant colonels right now came up through cyber because it didn't exist. So it's either comm or intel or it's a parallel field, but it's not exactly the same. Sure. Um, the second thing I brought to the table, I brought over from the soft community uh, or recon community um, was that like NCO forward kind of approach where if I want to talk, you know, uh, sniping, I want to talk to the sniper. Even if he's an sure. E5, I want to talk yeah. to that man or woman who's going to make that shot where we weren't doing that as much in the cyber community. We, we know because I have an officer, you know, he went to the Naval Postgraduate School, he's very technical, and so everybody wants to talk to him or her. Uh, but I, I was like, yeah, well, she, you could be there, but I want to talk to this, uh, you know, staff NCO or, or NCO is actually doing it. And so it's like a, kind of a culture shift. I think that the uh, airmen and sailors uh, who are doing those jobs appreciated that. And so I think that that helps kind of. Um, breaking those divides i like i tell stories a lot i kind of joke around uh that's just part of my personality i think that helps um kind of like lightens the mood it, it, that's tough too because i tell my like young officers i was like it's easier for me to do that because i'm 40 and i'm a lieutenant colonel so and everyone's always going to gonna recognize no, well, yeah. and they, ha they absolutely <laughs> have to that was I, I used to tell that joke when i was an instructor i'd be like hey what color is the shirt? Is it gray? Does it say instructor on the back? Then every joke is funny. You laugh at everything I put out there. So you get the same, that same sort of grift. Well, not just that. I mean, so as a, as a young officer, it's always worried about fraternization because the okay. line is much thinner. Whereas a, as a you know, 40 year old Lieutenant Colonel, that's not a problem because there's no world in which an E5 is like, this guy's my buddy. I'm going to hang so out I with can this be guy more on familiar. the weekend, yeah. right? <laughs> They're like, hell no, right? Man, this guy leaves. I've got a 22-year-old. Um, it's like 22 is like the youngest you're going to get a PJ, right? So like a, it takes that long. Uh, like sometimes you'll get a, like a 21-year-old, but usually 22 is like the youngest. 
this guy, I, I love him. He's an awesome dude. He's going to be a great PJ. He's a superstar. We're also never going to hang out in any real sense outside of work ever. And he is probably right now, like if he, if he hears this, he's going to go, Oh, thank God. Thank God. I can just turn Aaron down and never have to do that. Cause it's like the same thing. Like what, <laughs> what, what is my 40 year old self got in common with 22 year old Noah, <laughs> you know? As I do tell stories about, uh, you know, combat, like I have a, I have a young airman, uh, she just picked up tech sergeant, uh, shit hot. I mean, I, don't know, I think it was my first curse word. That's pretty you good. You did so good. I'm so proud uh, of you. I did, yeah. Now that I broke <laughs> the seal, though, I mean, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to go sideways. Go. Get yourself a lime um, flavored crayon and you just do whatever you want. To. Just, just get after it. No, so this young <laughs> airman, she would hold these stand-ups in the morning, right? And the uh, I don't, I don't want to bore you with the details, but it reminded me of a, you know, five paragraph order, you know, something that you'd give to a patrol right before you left, uh, you know, for a combat operation. And so I told her a story about how, uh, I don't know if you remember Nowzad, it's an area in Afghanistan that was pretty, uh, pretty challenging, you know, for the Marines. And I had a, I had a buddy of mine, uh, Gabriel Guest, uh, he was a machine gunner uh, as a sergeant, like so a uh, section leader in my rifle platoon uh, when I was in Iraq, my first deployment. And so he's now, uh, I think he was a gunny or staff sergeant, maybe gunny, uh, in this, uh, it was a Fox 27 in Nowzad. And I was going to that area to do, I was uh, with force, uh, second platoon, first force, uh, going to go do some raids in there. And I was like, man, I can't wait to see, you know, gunny guest. It, it's been, gosh, so long. And then guest uh, is in a tick. Uh, one of the squad leaders uh, steps on an IED. He, I think, I don't know if it was an IED RPG, but I mean, just his entire leg is just completely destroyed. Um, and so in one fell swoop, the squad or platoon loses platoon sergeant, uh, squad leader, uh, and several of their NCOs in this engagement. And we showed up like as is happening. So he's literally getting medevaced out. Um, and then, then I'm showing up, you know, in the, in the next nightmare. couple of days, what just an absolute disaster. nightmare, just terrible. Um, it's just so sad for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, he, uh, he actually amputated his leg. He asked him to amputate his legs to stay in the Marine Corps. Cause uh, that's the, you know, the kind of person that we lead in the in the military just incredible um because he wouldn't be able to run with the leg but he could run on a prosthesis he's actually still active duty um and this yeah, happened we had, a, oh, wait. we had a pj that did the same thing so a good friend of mine incredible. actually graduated the pipeline with him he was like listen this below knee amputation i get it it's, it's just not working though and i want to be a pj so just amputated above the knee and we'll go with the prosthetic game like the guys that make those decisions are unreal well and so this is this is why i tell the officers right be the officer that deserves to lead that kind of individual. They're incredible. So I don't care what GPA you got at the Air Force Academy or at the Naval Academy. I mean, you're not Gabriel Guest. None of us are, right? And I mean, I'll try to meet that standard for my entire career, but I mean, that's what keeps me going. You know, uh, I mean, that's just, uh, that's, they mean books about those kind of guys. But anyway, I, uh, I, I see now this, uh, it was a team leader, is now the squad leader. I'm really worried about the squad. I was like, these, they've lost all their leadership. And he sat down and ran through a five paragraph word like he's been doing all his life. And he just had the rapt attention of everybody in that squad. You know, hey, I'm, you know, Lance Corporal so-and-so, E3. And uh, this is what we're going to do. You know, we're going to go to this area, try to do some recovery of, uh, you know, some of the artifacts left over from these, you know, Marines, da-da-da-da-da. It was great. And I told her, I was like, you remind me of him. The way that you are managing and leading these cyber professionals is just like that Lance Corporal did in Nowzad. And what you're doing is just as important. It's very different. But I would rather you be successful here so Lance Cripple Smith doesn't have to do that. If you can go out there, you know, and find, uh, you know, these, these, these seams in the enemy systems and shut them down in, in, a, in a time of conflict so that we don't have to send, you know, young Lance Corporals, you know, through the breach to go do this stuff. And then so I think that that was impactful. I was probably a lot better at telling the story uh, when I did it at work. Uh, but it seemed like it's not something that they experience. It's not something that they're exposed to. And so, they, you know, a lot of them came by and told me they appreciated that. And she's obviously was beaming. Uh, which was deserved, uh, but it, it's fun. Yeah, it's I, I really enjoy it. Dude, I'm motivated. I'm, I mean, you're, <laughs> yeah, you weren't I'm even saying it to up. me. I'm just like in the area, and I'm like, oh, I, I'm not smart enough to be cyber, so I'm a little sad that I can't come out and work for you right now. But um, sir, we 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 do uh, the the podcast is mostly focused on people before they join, and we try to give them advice and, and tips and help uh, to help them be successful as they they join the military, whether they're on the officer side or the enlisted side. And, and you obviously have a, a lot of experience, tactical. You're very technical now on that side of the fence. Um, but if you can go all the way back and give someone one piece of advice before they're about to join, what would it be? Well, you should have given me this uh, up front so I could have been stewing <laughs> over this uh, 
<laughs> last night over beer come up with something That's really not the uh, way we do it no we yeah. i don't know why but we started doing uh i, I think brian kind of started that thing he just started doing yeah. like oh yeah just real quick at the end if you had to boil everything that you know of leadership down into one sentence to give to somebody that's looking for a purpose in life, what would it be? We love it. It's the one thing that we love to Good. do. So, right. proceed. Well, so my, my boilerplate uh, in my commander's philosophy has always been, uh, you know, uh, what did every day is a selection, every task is a test. Um, I think I boiled that together from a lot of different people's philosophies. But I think that the, the one thing that really strikes, you know, true to me is you just got to be a, a man or woman of character. So, I mean, let's pretend you have the fortitude or you know, the strength to do whatever you want to do with soft or whatever you want to do in the military. But, you know, the, the bank of integrity is a place that you can only make so many withdrawals, right? You can deposit all your life and you withdraw once. And I mean, that might be it. And so, you know, you think about the PT test that you cheat on or, you know, something, some other rule that you break. And so that, that those are mistakes that you really can't come back from. And there's a lot of things you could do that you can mess up, right? You can embarrass yourself. You know, you, uh, you got the, the second class PFT, that's okay. That's recoverable, but lying or cheating or, or stealing and some of these things, you know, or, or using drugs. Some of our young people just get completely sidelined on this stuff and you see their, your careers just vanish. And sometimes their lives are ruined uh, depending on what they did um, and, and how they're discharged. And that's, that's, I think what hurts me the most. Right. And then when you're in a, I don't, I don't know how PJ training is. I'm, I'm assuming it's super difficult, right. You're in these intense situations where you're like, Oh, I got to get it done. Right. And that's where, you, you know, you start, your moral compass starts to kind of waver a little bit. And that's where I would say, just stay on the track, right? And if you're a person uh, who has a lot of potential, a lot of promise, I, I bet you two would do what you could to get that person across the finish line, right? And maybe that's the test. As you know, as you're, if you're as strong in your, in your heart, uh, in your moral, moral fiber as you are with your body uh, and mind, uh, that might be the triad that you, uh, you're, you're seeking in your, in your community. I, I can't think of a time where we received a better answer to that question. <laughs> that is head. a fantastic so, answer, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so if I could just keep going down that road, right? I mean, so you you don't just become courageous on the battlefield, right? It's not something that you just overnight be like, oh, I'm going to show valor, you know, here. I think you have it throughout your whole, you know, your whole life, right? And so if you're doing it in garrison, if you're doing the right thing in garrison, you're going to do the right thing in combat, right? I, I always tell people, man, I, uh, so I got, I got blown up a lot, uh, so I was one of, the, I'm one of the best Marines you've ever seen at fighting IEDs. I just usually found them with my face, which is not the technique. <laughs> oh, perfect, That's approved. Yeah. I mean, it they is a technique. Manuals. It is a technique. <laughs> yeah. Super effective for the yeah. guy like five behind you. It's just like, well, that's it's better. That's done. Um, <laughs> God, I was, I don't I was, like, I was terrified, them. right? I got hit with the fuel gas IED in 06 outside of Baghdad. I just remember like the fire and the heat, you know, and like the searing in my, in my lungs. And I mean, fortunately, I'm not scarred. I mean, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty quick. Um, but like I fast forward like oh wait I remember uh, getting hit with another uh, it was an RPG barrage in my vehicle and the vehicle's on fire and they had that split second of um, just like fear right and panic it just felt like uh, just really paralyzed in my seat but then as soon as I started hearing my Marines it's just like it's just, it's an autopilot right you're just gonna start moving and doing stuff because you're like I have a job to do and I never thought about it I mean, like well after the event uh, and I and I thought about it I was like because you know what I, my whole life my whole career I've attuned myself to, I just got to do is right by my Marines whether it's in garrison or it's in combat. Um, you know, I probably blow my timeline here. I could tell stories, you know, for days. Uh, I had item ring get a, a two DUI silver star recipient. And uh, I brought his uh, uh, reenlistment papers and everybody above me in the chain of command said, no. And so this is a Marine. He was a Nazaria vet, Fallujah vet, Ramadi vet. I mean, this is a person as a sniper, a, a triple digits kills. Not that we, we, we track that. But I mean, this is a person who's done a lot for a nation. We've asked a lot of them. And then his, uh, you know, his dad dies. He's clearly got some, uh, you know, combat stress issues that he tried to medicate with some alcohol. And so in the span of, you know, seven days, had two DUIs. And so by the time the blotter hits, they both come in at once. And so I brought the, the papers, right? I, brought, I got a, like a manila folder and I went to the division. CG. I'm not making this up, right? I don't know how I'm still in. Now they're, they're going to take my battalion away. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I don't know if. You, hey, listen, we can always edit stuff out. That's all I'm saying. So you can. no. So uh, I go to the CP, right? And I got these papers. And I'm a captain, right? Yeah. So I was back when I was Force Recon, and uh, so I just look kind of like flustered. And so then everyone's like, "Oh, this is tracking, Captain Division CP." Flustered, lots of papers, and so I, I start walking down the 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 office. You're walking right? quickly, just, muttering yeah, to yourself. Like, the classic. Like, I'm sense. too busy to talk to you. Yeah. No, this guy. And then I cool. pass by the CG's door, and he's you know he's got like that like L-shaped door or hallway where you kind of go through the door, and there's like the staff secretary, sure, and then the yeah. executive assistant, and everything. 
And man, I just go in there like Marshawn Lynch, just like boom, boom, left, right, left. <laughs> you you know I'm here. Ducking through all these people. And I slide in his office completely unannounced, obviously. Clearly, no appointment. Surprise. It's the general Paxton, let me get this. Violent he's got his glasses on. He looks up and then it's like basically my entire chain of command is like following me like one of those Chinese dragons on like a Chinese New Year, you know. <laughs> and then the uh chief of staff's like, I'll take care of this, sir. And the CG's like, No, he, he's just bought himself five minutes. It's clearly important. You know, I went into him and I was like, you know, hey, sir, uh, you know, you denied uh, uh, this Marine reenlistment um, as a sergeant. And he's like, I did. He's got two DUIs. And so I, I laid down the, the Silver Star citation and I, and I, I gave him, uh, you know, my spiel. And then he, he crossed it out and he says, approved. He's like, I, you know, I was like, I, I understand that. And I told him, I was like, you know, we're going to have broken Marines and a, a Marine who's fixed himself like this Marine did. He got the two DUIs, went to combat, earned a Silver Star. I think this is someone that we should retain. Right. Or otherwise, we're just going to have porcelain dolls on the drill field. Right. Who know more about trees and Krauses than they do, you know, disassembling and assembling a, an M240 golf. And so what happens when the next Marine breaks? Is, is that porcelain doll going to know what to do? Or, or is, you know, uh, Frank over here going to be able to lead that dude into fire and then back out and then know how to help him? Be like, hey, man, you know, what are you doing? Are you drinking Jack and Cokes at, you know, eight in the morning on, on a TAD that we're going to, uh, you know, the range or whatever? Let me talk to you about my struggle. Right. I went down that pit. I got out. CG's like, I'm bought, I'm sold, signed it. And he's like, go pay your penance. And like my, literally my entire chain of command is like waiting outside for me. <laughs> and I'm you like, knew, you knew too oh, long super that convenient. door, but them following you in that room. You're super like, convenient oh, though. I was like, you know, just go one station to the next, right? And so uh, get my ass chewed. It's like, who's they, next, they, right? So the big question here is, that, did they go in ascending order or descending order? Like, did the boss want his crack at you first? Or did you have to work your way to the final boss? Well, I think it's funny, it's just proximity, but like the chief of staff, like the general's not mad. So he's like, I don't, I'm, I'm confused as to what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did you survive this? Somewhere, and the like, CG was, was like. <laughs> there was just a call. I was like, give me the crustiest E8. Is there the crustiest <laughs> E8 in this room right now? Tell me why I should be mad at this guy, because I guarantee that guy knows. Well, it's funny because the sergeant major was like right on, right? Yeah. You know, he's like, dude, you know, he's like, you know, this officer, he's like, you put yourself on line for your Marine, not for yourself. So he's like, nothing wrong with that, right? But then, you know, they're like, well, you're still going to have to get your ass chewed, right? Like, it's, the, you know, it's like oh, taxes. Yeah. It's yeah. still happening, I mean, I've, right? I've had, my, <laughs> I've had my ass chewed before, you know? But uh, I think they all respected it, but, you know, it still, it still has to happen. Um, yeah, so that Marine's, uh, uh, he made platoon sergeant, right? He's a, he's a gunny now. So he got promoted. He not only got retained, but he got promoted a couple times. And so it's like stuff like that. that I, I feel like I made a difference in the world. You know, like that can... Not much I can say I did myself, but like that one thing I was able to do, and I could change that, you know, some Marine's life for the better, even if it's one person, uh, that's what makes command cool for me or being in my position. I've gotten a couple of Marines or purple hearts. I had, uh, had a Marine had to get a reclama, you know, cause the admin section and hadn't fixed it. And this guy's out. He's been out for 10 years. He's like, Hey, sir, can you help me out? And I was like, yeah, sure. Because you know, when he emailed the battalion commander, he gets crickets. When I emailed the battalion commander, I get a response. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wrote the package up for him. Put it in. I was like, hey, man, can you sign this? Sure, great. Let's go. Boom, Purple Heart. I mean, how much, you know, meaning that have that young Marine he puts his uniform back on, you know, 10 years later? Uh, I don't know. That, that that's makes me feel, like, really professionally satisfied, you know, what, what I do. And so probably been cooler to be, a, you know, an E6 PJ, you know, like you guys <laughs> run around having fun. Uh, but, you know, we got, we got to do good jobs of this, too. So that's why I encourage people, you know, to look at both paths. Absolutely, and PJs are are they're okay, but they're not the end all. How dare you? How dare you? You know I'm a fanboy. You know, no, I'm a SR guy. I'm a former weather nerd, so I don't even know why I'm here most of the time. But I, sir, I think as we wrap this up, hair on the show, so which is a direct insult to all PJs everywhere. Um, I think you've shown that the the person of integrity and and character that you are uh, through your stories, and I think uh just thanks for coming on here and everybody out there listening it's not about you it's about taking care of other people it's about getting the job done and and honestly if you uh go back to the beginning of this and, and listen to it all over again because if you want to know all about being a good leader and being a good person uh i think this is one of the best podcasts we've ever put together so sir again thank you absolutely for coming on here and uh this one's ready signing off we'll catch you next time later sir thanks very much thanks for coming on yeah, I'm trying to think of some of the funny stories I was, I was, I was dialing up to tell. I don't think I told. I think we took, I took this one a little serious. Was it was it too serious? No, it's perfect. That was great. No, yeah, it was it was absolutely awesome. And you have an open invite. You can come back on. We can bring you on for story time whenever you want. Yeah. We we need to bring you back on. Like I was trying to I was think. Getting amped up over here.
That was a. All right, I got one. I mean, you can edit this, right? You can you can put it back in there. See if it fits. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So the one story I have is uh, when I was a second lieutenant in the infantry. This is, this is a, the infantry world is very different uh, kind of marine uh, kind of environment that you have. You know, cyber people. A lot less NJPs over here. I don't know what you have in the Air Force, like non-judicial punishment. It's, just, it's the same, sir. I don't know why you keep yeah. saying it like we're like some corporate branch of the the place that you work, but we all it's the same <laughs> thing. All the terms are essentially the same, really. Well, we all know that the, the Air Force is a corporation, the Marine Corps is a cult, right? There are only two services, the Navy and <laughs> the Army. It is what it is. Um, okay, perfect. But you gotta be more specific with Marines, like especially infantry Marines. Otherwise, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. And so I'm on officer of the day, I'm a second lieutenant. Uh, and, I, and I get a phone call from one of the you know guards uh, or the uh, duties essentially to each of the barracks. And you know, this Marine, he uh, calls me up. He's like, "Hey, sir, we got a problem." I was like, "Okay, great. This is what I've been trained to do. I've been through all this coursework. I'm ready to take it. You know, take command of the plan of the day. Give the me the ethical commander. dilemma and 100%. watch me crush it. What do we got?" He's like, I got water coming out of a pipe. And I was like, well, so I was expecting a little bit bigger of a challenge of a first day. You know, <laughs> did, you tr- did you turn the water off, Marine? No, so I, I, I said, I was like, hey, describe what's happening to you right now. He's like, there's a pipe, a lot of water coming out. I'm like, keep going. Like, there's a lever, it's red, as next to where the water's coming out. I'm like, is it ahead of the water or behind? He's like, I don't know, sir. I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Is this a raid in kind of a perpendicular fashion or parallel fashion? He's like, so I don't know what the hell either one of those things are. I'm like, okay, just turn the lever. I'm just going to take a leap of faith here and then just turn the lever. So he turns the lever. And he's like, water stopped. And I'm like, well, hallelujah, right? So what we get paid for, you know, I go out by day, keep going. <laughs> 30 minutes go by and he's like, so we got another problem. I was like, well, what do you got, man? He got, we got a big old puddle here. And I'm like, what, what do you want me to do? And he's it's just probably like, from the water earlier. It's a, it's a problem I'm from, the, from the water. Like, well, just take a couple cones. We're going to put them out. You got cones? Like I got a bunch of cones. I'm gonna take the cones, put them around the water. That way, people know if you know they don't see the huge puddle of water, not the walk through. And he's like, "All right, sir. Okay. Call 30 minutes later. Hi, sir. There's a bobcat drinking the water. I'm like, well, you need to listen to me very carefully right now. <laughs> Under no circumstances are he you to do anything. The bobcat. He's gonna with listen, the bobcat. He's gonna try to. He's gonna try to catch that bobcat. You know like, exactly no, no, what's no. going on. That Bobcat is now the, the first of the 25th or however it is you guys do your units. That's the new mascot. That thing is going to have a t-shirt on it that says yut, and it's going to be running around oh. biting people. It's not supposed to be biting in about 35 seconds. You know how this story ends. It starts <laughs> It starts off with a puddle, and it ends up with the Bobcat wielding demons of the one of the 25th. You know it. <laughs> I'm like, hey, devil dog, under no circumstances are you to do anything with the bobcat. He's like, sir, I need to take command of the situation. I'm like, the situation <laughs> is handled. The way we're going to handle the situation is a bobcat. No, call the game warden. We're going to call the game warden who's going to come with the little noose in their little cage, and they're going to put the bobcat in there, take him back out in the woods. It's going to be fine. He's like, all right, Did sir. bobcat go to any worse puddle? The worst puddle that this bobcat could have chosen. <laughs> there is now at least one motivated Marine involved in the bobcat clearing operation. Worst possible decision making for the Bobcat. So I get a call from, <laughs> from the from the Marine. He's like, "Sir, that Bobcat is pissed off, <laughs> just running up and down the camp, trying to bite on people, just chasing folk. I don't know what to do." And I'm just like, "What happened?" He's like, "I called the game ward." And then he's like, "That that was it, sir." I was Liar. like, "That's, that's all no, that happened." No, and then I sprayed it with his bear mace. All right, so we had this. So you you heard this story already. <laughs> no. <laughs> but That's I just incredible. thought to myself, what would be ridiculous? Well, we had this bear maze, right? No, so the, <laughs> the Marines is like, well, I I didn't like the way he was looking at me. And so I got my pepper spray and I was like, you're what now? A pepper spray. I'm like, where, where did you get do you, me- <laughs> do you remember the part of this story, Marine, where you had uh you asked for a pistol and I said, under no circumstances, no, you don't get a pistol. And then I saw your pepper spray. And then I took it away because I said, you don't need pepper spray, right? And you're like, how do I defend myself? I'm like, with your cell phone, you call somebody for help. You call somebody. And you stay in your little shack, right? That's all you do. And I'm like, how'd you get pepper spray? He's like, oh, sir, I got like 10, 15 bottles of that back in my room. <laughs> you just took away the one. And so he gets the pepper spray, sprays the shit on his Bobcat, which, spoiler alert, Bobcat's pretty upset right now. And so he's just running around the camp. And so the game board shows up. I mean, the poor guy looks like he's gotten like some sort of slap contest with like Freddy Krueger and we're scissor hands because Bobcat's just 
Or this, this guy actually, guy up, right? this guy lived Joe Rogan's nightmare. He went toe to toe with oh, a pop. Man. Well, it'd be toe to 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 toe because of poor feet. But the problem <laughs> is, is Joe Rogan's been talking about not going up against cats for so long, and this Marine is just like, I don't like the way it's eyeballing me. This is going down. No, so the Marine was fine. It was the game warden that got jacked up, right? And the game warden's like, I think this thing's rabid. <laughs> Look at his eyes. This is red little beady <laughs> eyes. And, you know, it's just, that's a. I was I like, I don't know. That. I guess you got to get it tested. I'm not. I'm not an expert in bobcat, and so I'm uh, not an expert in bob. The only thing I know about bobcats is that bobcats, cougars, lynx, pumas, ocelots, that whole like all of them are the same family of cat. It's the same exact creature. Leopards, pumas, bobcats, mountain lions, lynx. They're all the same, varying sizes. So what, what I learned knowledge. that day was uh, the second the German marine calls in a bobcat catastrophe, <laughs> uh, you got to you got to move your feet. <laughs> get get over there, take a man situation. Or you're gonna, you're sideways, to, yeah. uh, real quickly, right? <laughs> I love <laughs> the fact. I love the fact that Operation Bobcat is now a, a definite 100% thing. 100%. I think there's a yeah. T-shirt now. Yeah, t-shirt, Operation I Bobcat. I love yeah. it. I love Operation Bobcat. That's the 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 best possible. They, they have the dumbest names for those anyway. Operation Lava Stone. Operation Victor Lynx. The, the operation Marine, names some man. places they just get the dumbest so hey last right. thing as you know uh, you know where uh most people get bit by snakes feet and ankles mm-hmm. yeah you know where most where marines get bit by snakes if you go to camp penalty you say where did most of these snake bites occur or hands hands face and hands <laughs> <laughs> it makes a lot of sense i was like what would a marine do they would get close to it and try to touch it and get let me just 100 percent just poke it. Well, hey, everyone, thanks for having me on the on the podcast. Hope this uh, was helpful for uh, not only the, those in the virtual room, but those uh, trying to become uh, airmen, uh, special operators of any variety. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for your time. Yeah, sir. Man, we, we appreciate it. I'm glad we worked this one out. Um, and then look for it. We'll release in a couple weeks. If you've got any, any pictures, any cool guy pictures, if they're... Yeah, I'll, I'll, send, I'll, I'll text them to you. I don't know yeah, if they're that cool, it. but I'll send you what I have. <laughs> That'd be great. And we can make the uh, we can make the thumbnail up. But hey, we really appreciate it. So anytime you want to come back on, we'd love to have you on. That was amazing. All right. Well, well thanks, fellas. All right. Work, here. sir. Gotta go. Hoorah. Hey.